<laughs> okay, great. Thanks for attending the uh, after town hall uh, session, and I think I'll just be super brief uh, and let the presenters get to it, so we'll have lots of times for questions. Our first talk is by uh, Zhao Ji Mao on fairness under unawareness. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Xiao Jie Mao. I'm a PhD student in statistics from Cornell University. And today, I'd like to talk about the uh, outcome disparity assessment when the protected class is unobserved. So this is joint work with my wonderful collaborators, Nathan Kanas, Melanie Woodell, Jia Hao Chen, and Jeff Svasha. Um, so our project is particularly motivated by the fair lending application. And uh, in the United States, some fair lending laws prohibit the banks from discriminating their customers, uh, specifically based on some protected classes like race, gender, and sex, and et cetera. And uh, in order to evaluate the compliance with the laws, the regulators need to assess the outcome disparity, um, namely the systematic difference in the decision outcomes received by uh, you know, different protected classes. And one interesting challenge is how we can do this if we cannot observe the protected class. And uh, interestingly, in financial industries, actually, the regulators don't have race and ethnicity information about the customers um, you know, for all the non-mortgage products, like credit card, like auto loan, and et cetera. And they still need to assess the outcome disparity with respect to race and ethnicity. Um, so it turns out that one regulator called the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau proposed to use a proxy model to impute the protected class first and then estimate the disparity based on such an imputed class. And uh, the proxy model they propose is called the Bayesian Improved Surname Geocoding, which essentially estimates people's race based on their surname and geolocation. And the probabilities are essentially the fraction of people belonging to different races given the surname and the geolocation. So in this example, the surname is Smith and the geolocation is California. And we find that 70% of people are white. So the BISG output probability for white race would be 70%. And in a similar way, we can find probabilities for other races. And after we have such probabilities, we can use a commonly used threshold rule to impute the race. And this threshold rule starts with specifying a threshold. Uh, let's say it's 65% here. And then the threshold rule uh, classifies all people with given surname and geolocation into a race group whose probability exceeds this threshold. So here, white probability is 70%, which exceeds this threshold. So we classify everybody as white here. We give them white hats to denote such an imputation. And, uh, but sometimes we cannot do so because sometimes none of the risk probabilities exceeds such a threshold. And in this case, a common practice is to simply drop all the people from the subsequent outcome disparity evaluation. And in practice, people usually use very high threshold, like 80% or 90%, because this indicates high confidence about the risk classification results. But at the same time, I also want to note that uh, this would also cause high sample loss. Um, in 2013, uh, CFPB's analysis based on such a proxy method led to $98 million against uh, Anibank in the autonomous market because of charging their minority customers with this disproportionately higher interest rate than the uh, white customers. Uh, this arose a lot of controversies, and in particular, uh, some researchers actually re um, evaluated such a ma proxy method on some mortgage data sets where the uh, race is available. And they found that um, using such a proxy method actually tends to overestimate the outcome disparity, which means that uh, the claiming discrimination in the Anibank case might be you know, artifact from using the proxy method. And uh, the question that we are very interested in our project is why there is such an overestimation bias. And if underestimation bias is possible, uh, so we're not criticizing of using such a uh, method by the regulators, but we do aim to understand better about such a tool that led to very, very influential decisions. So in the following part, I'd like to use a very simple toy example in lending to illustrate our main results. Uh, but before that, let me define our disparity measure first. So here we'll consider the so-called demographic disparity measure. 
Uh, and in the known application example, is simply the difference between the average known acceptance rates for the advantage group and the disadvantage group. And because we cannot observe the true prototype class, so we impute that first by that threshold rule, and we estimate the outcome disparity. So our problem here is, what is estimation bias when we estimate the disparity based on imputed class rather than the true class? So this is our very simple example here. Uh, we only consider geolocation in the proxy model, and uh, we consider a high-income neighborhood primarily occupied by the advantage group, and a low-income neighborhood primarily occupied by the disadvantage group. So this sort of captures the racial segregation in the society. And also, uh, according to structure rule, we would classify everybody from a high-income neighborhood as advantage group, and everybody from low-income neighborhood as the disadvantage group. And also, we assume that the people who have a higher income tend to have a higher acceptance rates. So now I'd like to analyze the bias from using the threshold rule I mentioned. And it turns out that the estimation bias depends on two different bias sources. The first one we call it intergeolocation variation, where uh, the acceptance rates vary across different geolocations. So they are 100% for high-income neighborhood and 0% for uh, low-income neighborhood here. Um, and we found that um, we would overestimate the outcome disparity for advantage group and underestimate the outcome disparity for disadvantage group. And uh, I'm sorry, underestimate the average acceptance rates for disadvantage group. And as a result, the intergeolocation variation causes overestimation bias for the final outcome disparity. So why does this happen? The primary reason is that uh, people with high acceptance rates tend to have higher socioeconomic status and live in places primarily occupied by the advantage group. And as a result, they are more likely to be classified as the advantage group under proxy model. And by the same token, people who have low acceptance rates are more likely to be classified as a disadvantage group. And the people who have sort of intermediate acceptance rates tend to be removed from the study. So in this way, using imputed rates tends to magnify the outcome disparity because the geolocations in the proxy model embed a lot of existing socioeconomic status bias. We call the second bias source the intergeolocation variation where the acceptance rates vary only within the same geolocation for different protected classes. So specifically here, this advantage group has lower acceptance rates than the advantage group. And we found that um, uh, this intergeolocation variation has the exact opposite behavior and it tends to cause underestimation bias. So our analysis further shows that uh, the overall estimation bias of this threshold estimator depends on very complex interplay of the intergeolocation variation and intergeolocation variation. And uh, the relative influence of the intergeolocation variation depends on quantity that's very sensitive to the threshold. And in previous study, people usually use very high threshold, like 80%, 90%, uh, which causes the intergeolocation variation to dominate, which explains the final overestimation bias. But if the threshold is very, very low, then it's possible to have underestimation bias. But overall, the estimation bias is just very delicate. And uh, if we think about the problem with the threshold rule, then one problem is that um, it gives the determinist risk label to all people, which ignores the intrinsic uncertainty in risk classification given only surname and geolocation. So we propose an alternative uh, which gave a sort of a fractional risk assignment. Uh, we gave multiple risk labels to all people uh, and also with the output probability as, as the weight. And we can also evaluate, our, evaluate the outcome disparity. And uh, for this weighty estimator, it's robust to the intergeolocation variation, but the intergeolocation variation still tends to cause underestimation bias in practice. Let me summarize our uh, results a bit. So here we analyze a commonly used threshold estimator in the previous literature, and we found that his bias depends on a very complex interplay of two opposing bias sources. And in practice, it tends to overestimate the disparity uh, because of the use of geolocation that embeds existing societal inequality, and also a hard threshold rule that ignores the intrinsic uncertainty in classifying race. And also, its bias is very sensitive to the threshold. The overall direction of the bias is um, uh, rather unsure. And uh, we propose an alternative uh, whose bias is simpler to reason about because it's uh, 
um, it only depends on one single source and also tends to underestimate the outcome disparity in reality. And uh, finally, the ubiquitous presence of estimation bias also reveals that uh, it's very challenging to evaluate outcome disparity without true protected class. So finally, I'd like to uh, encourage you to read our paper for more general theory on categorizing the estimation bias when using proximodal, even we only consider a very simple example here, and we also have real data analysis backing up my statements about this landing example. And that's my talk for today, and thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Our next talk will be by Nishi, Nishith Vishnoi. Uh, thanks, Nicole. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about a meta-algorithm for fair classification, uh, which works in a variety of settings. It gives you a single unified algorithm for a various number of fairness metrics, and it also comes with mathematical guarantees. And this is joint work with uh, my very talented and wonderful colleagues and students, Elisa Salis, Ling Xiao Huang, and Vijay K. Swani. So let me just start with a quick review of the classification problem, which I'm sure you have seen many times. You're given a bunch of uh, data, which corresponds to, let's say, individuals. And your goal is to decide whether to give someone a loan or not. So this is just an example of a classic classification problem in machine learning. And the traditional machine learning approach to this problem is to first identify what training data will be used to learn uh, the classifier develop a model for it, and then once you have a model, formulate it as an optimization problem, and then develop an optimization problem uh, for this. And these, all these choices are made by very, very smart individuals, uh, except that in the traditional sense, um, most of the focus is on trying to identify parameters for the model, which given the data, possibly along with the labels, maximizes the accuracy. And this gives rise to a classifier, which in this case is just a straight line from among the possible straight lines that you could have chosen to dissect the population into two parts, one which you give loan and one which you don't give loan. So what's the problem with this uh, uh, traditional machine learning approach? Uh, I guess that's why we are here. This, this is why this conference is here. This approach doesn't work. There are many, many examples of uh, from facial recognition to lending biases to, you know, uh, racial biases in bail applications to the deployment of uh, machine learning tools in autonomous weapons where again things uh, are being observed. <clears throat> so this, uh, this uh, approach of just maximizing accuracy doesn't seem to work and the reason is the data also has sensitive attributes. For instance, in this example, gender. And this is not really taken into account while developing a model or, um, or training um, or you know, in any of the stages of this pipeline. And over the last several years, uh, the, there are a lot of a wide variety of metrics that have been identified to demonstrate how brittle and broken these classifiers are. And some of them are uh, things like group fairness or statistical parity, false positive calibration, negative predictive parity, false discovery, false omission, and the list keeps going on and on and on. So <clears throat> what are the approaches that the uh, machine learning community has taken to process this? Well, there are three possible places where you could address the issue of classification. One is in pre-processing data. Second one is constraining the optimization problem, and the third is post-processing output. This paper is about looking at the second stage in the pipeline, constrained optimization, and here, for each and every different metric uh, that I listed and not listed, there are many, many papers, uh, including probably many of you who, in this room who have worked on this problem. <clears throat> so what's the issue? The issue is that, um, for different metrics, there are different algorithms, and in, in, in some sense, it's not always easy to um, compare them or use them. And, and there are also very important metrics, uh, for example, predictive parity or false discovery, false omission, which are quite important for tasks like recidivism, stop risk, or to, to predict whether you, uh, you know, a patient would have a certain heart condition or not, where we still do not have right classification or fair classification algorithms. So our contribution is a unified algorithmic framework 
to this constrained optimization based fair classification approach which in a single shot gives us several old results and new results uh, with respect to a large class of fairness metrics. And in particular, uh, our methods work with uh, what we call linear or linear fractional fairness metrics, and I'll explain this in a little bit. Um, the implementation of our algorithm is simultaneously competitive with uh, many of these aforementioned algorithms, and in particular, if you're curious, our algorithm appears in this IBM's AI Fairness 362, uh, where it, you can see how it compares. And finally, I think, uh, for me personally, I think it's important to have some kind of guarantees, uh, uh, you know, beyond just simulations, and so our method also comes with uh, provable mathematical guarantees. <clears throat> so, um, so the starting point is trying to understand how to capture constraints in a more abstract manner. And so one thing uh, I guess we can notice that given a data set which is labeled, for instance, so here you have people along with the label whether they got the loan or they did not got, get the loan, um, which is y equal to one and y equal to zero. You could also have the output of a classifier which we are trying to search. So suppose you pick a classifier F and you look at how does that predict, uh, what happens is that this divides the, the space into four different regions, depending upon the four possible outcomes of the two classifiers. And then in each region, you can also look at the fraction of each type, sensitive type that you're interested in. And with all this information, you can start constructing a fairness metrics. So many fairness metrics just look at these numbers. So in this particular example, there are eight possible numbers. And you can start writing functions of these eight numbers. So here I have written down for you false discovery, uh, where for each gender, let's say male, female, other, uh, there is a performance function for a particular classifier, which is, uh, where, where you, you can express it as the ratio of these pr probabilities. And so, so many of these uh, methods uh, uh, for fair classification try to uh, take an input, a parameter tau, which controls the fairness, and, um, and impose constraints like this, that the, the worst and the best performing groups should not be too far from each other. In fact, they should be within a fraction of uh, the specified number tau. So this is, in some sense, captures a large number of uh, fairness metrics. So our observation is, uh, the first observation is that, as this example demonstrates, that even though these constraints look like ratios or sums and so on, there is a specific, there is not a very complex class through which they can be captured. And this, is, uh, this can be captured by linear combinations and then their ratios. And <coughs> Of constraints like, or of probabilities like this. So you look at the probability that the classifier is one condition on a particular sensitive attribute and a prior. And our approach, this is uh, something similar to what you saw in Elisa's talk earlier, is to simplify these constraints to just specifying lower bounds and upper bounds in this, uh, uh, with this for each of these performance functions for in this particular example, for each gender, I will need to specify these lower bounds and upper bounds. The resulting op optimization problem, even though we started off with something complicated, ends up being simple enough for us to use tools from convex optimization to solve them. And the second a set of results for us, which is algorithmic, we really also give algorithms for this problem, is to come up with an efficient reduction from any one of these performance functions which could form in either linear or linear fractional constraints to a sequence of carefully and automatically chosen optimization problems which have the type that I just showed you in the previous, uh, previous slide. Where, remember our goal was to find a classifier which maximizes accuracy subject to your favorite linear fractional constraints, which, uh, which, you know, which are mostly non-convex. And what we do is, given the parameter tau that you specified and the constraints, um, 
uh, we, we construct a sequence of problems where we choose the values of L and U, the lower bound and the upper bound, for each particular sensitive type, and then solve our problem, and then output the most accurate classifier from the ones that we have, uh, the set of problems that we have solved. So just to conclude, uh, our method uh, gives in a very uh, uh, unified manner a lot of results. Not everything is done. One can look at more constraints, more classifier families, and different accuracy functions, and try to come up with meta-algorithms in these settings. Well, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. I, I'm sorry, I'm kind of scared of Max. I work for Microsoft. Um, <laughs> so uh, the last talk of the session is by Carlos, uh, and we will be hearing about a comparative study of fairness enhancing interventions in machine learning. Thank you, Nicole, for the introduction. Um, Thank you so much for being here. Um, I want to tell you today about a study I have conducted in collaboration with Sorel, Suresh, and um, their students, Sonam, Evan, and Derek. So um, first of all, I want to start sort of on a personal note. I want to thank sort of uh, all of you. I'm a computer scientist by training, and um, sort of uh, this is one of the conferences where I come to sort of just realize, like, you know, sort of sit here for 48 hours and have my mind blown sort of perpetually, and sort of, um, our training is sort of woefully inadequate, and so, you know, like a big part of sort of like my changing worldview in the last three years comes from a lot of you in the audience, so I just want to thank you all for that. And I want to apologize for being part of the problem and sort of we're trying to fix it. <laughs> so um, what's the sort of pre-fat star history, right? So um, I'm a CS, a computer scientist by training, you know, you're sort of so excited to build these machine learning models that, you know, we sort of didn't really like think much about things, right? And sort of speaking from being part of the problem, I was in industry for five years, right? So we were so giddy to build the things that were sort of like social impact, what? No, this is great, right? Like we're, we're deploying this, this is going to be fantastic. Harm, this is cannot possibly, right? Um, then the next reaction was, well, <laughs> it's just math, right? Sort of, you know, we're building these things that are math, they're gonna replace these humans that are flawed, of course it's going to be objective, right? And so, um, Clearly this is not the case, and I think that sort of a large part of the education has come from many of you in the audience, so, you know, we're starting to move beyond that, but I sort of just want to, you know, again, sort of thank you as, um, as someone who's sort of going on this path of sort of realizing just how much uh, harm uh, a field that's uneducated is capable of doing, and like, I think this room is sort of like a big part of, of our attempt to, to remedy some of that. So. Uh, I think that sort of uh, one of the great signs of the progress in our field has been the fact that, you know, we started to sort of move beyond that, right? We have sort of an explosion of scholarly work, and I think last year's Narayana um, tutorial on the 21 definitions of fairness and their politics is a great example of just how much uh, progress we have made. We're now in a world where sort of we get to pick from 21 different fairnesses, or so they're differently connected to sort of philosophical statements about how we think the world should be and their politics, right? But of course, this comes with a problem, which is, you know, of those 21 fairness, you know, which one do you pick, right? Sort of, you know, should there be one that we pick? Maybe, is there a best one, right? We sort of would expect to say, just pick the best one and be done with it, right? Unfortunately, that's not true, right? Sort of, we have impossibility theorems, right? So Kleinberg and Kaudikova both have different theorems that say that it's impossible to choose one best notion of fairness, right? We're somehow going to be sort of forced to pick one of them in detriment of something else. And so even theoretically, this is the case. And what we were interested in specifically is sort of, you know, what happens when you contrast this with the examples of sort of deployments of machine learning and fair uh, ML algorithms, sort of we're calling them interventions, right? Sort of ways to improve fairness on our systems. What happens when you actually experimentally sort of uh, compare them, right? Sort of what happens when you just look at what happens in the real world with the algorithms and the data sets and the measures that exist out there, right? Do we find that things are, you know, there's only one algorithm that sort of dominates all of them? Is there one measure that works better than the other ones, right? Sort of independently of like what we know theoretically, we found that we didn't really have a good place to sort of just a central playground to go figure these things out, right? So I'll tell you a little bit today about one of the efforts that we made, right? So we essentially ran a comparison on a number of existing techniques, data sets, and measures. So this is sort of going to structure how I'm going to describe our results, right? It also means that there's a risk that we were not comprehensive, and so chances are that by the time I'm done here, you know, you should come and yell at me, sort of all the things that we've missed, and we want to fix them and incorporate them, you're going to hear this sort of through the rest of the talk, right? 
But we built a Python library that sort of lets us run these comparisons, right? So we collected everything that we could find in terms of the algorithms that we could build and run, the data sets that we thought were characteristic of the kinds of complications that we see in the literature that sort of should drive our sort of fair ML interventions, right? And so what did we find was sort of, uh, I don't know if Dane is here, sort of apologize for that. Uh, <laughs> But the reality is that it's complicated, right? We were kind of expecting to find one algorithm that worked better so that we can say, hey, you know, we run all these things for you so you don't have to think about them. Um, turns out that sort of in the process of this, we realized that this is a really bad idea given the results we've seen. Things are much more complicated, right? Sort of what we're thinking about now is that we want to make it easy for people to see sort of like the reality of the trade-offs that we need to make, not even in terms of like the fairness and the accuracy, but sort of where things go wrong and how. And I think that the, we heard one of the speakers say that sort of the results were delicate with respect to the threshold. We found very much the same kinds of things in our experiments, and we kind of want to report on sort of the things we found are sources of complications for these studies. Um, right. So the first thing we found is that these uh, measures, both of accuracy and of fairness on the fair interventions that we found, um, they're quite fragile. They depend on pre-processing of the data, for example. This is not something we expected. Right? I'm going to show you a specific example of what I mean by that. But one of the sort of typical ways in which uh, algorithms assume things about the world is that your protected attribute is binary, right? But that's often not the case, and now you have to make some decision about how to convert that to a binary decision. Turns out the way in which you choose this has a huge impact on sort of the resulting figures you get. But we don't tend to report this in our papers, so now how do we compare things, right? So that's problematic, right? We also found that, and this is maybe like the one silver line here, that. Um, you know, regardless of sort of the, the number of measures, 21, we think we have something like 35 in our library. Um, they all appear to be experimentally correlated more so than we expected, right? So in some sense, maybe it might be the case that sort of theoretically speaking, these things can happen, but they don't actually appear on the data sets that we tend to be sort of interested in because the sources of variation are small enough that they don't trigger these trade-offs. Or it could be that we actually missed some of the data sets, so we would sort of like to understand this better, but it turns out that it seems to be enough, and I'll show you a, a graph of what I mean by these, that sort of a small number of these fairness measures tend to capture the sources of variability on the results that we observe in practice. And sort of uh, finally, um, and this is I think the, in terms of sort of practical applications, this is the most important thing, but it's also the uh, saddest bit of news, is that we really did not find one intervention that performs sort of significantly better than the others, uh, which means that when you're sort of deploying something, your choice shouldn't really be about the hyperparameter of one specific algorithm, but potentially like which algorithm you choose for that specific data set seems to be a big effect, which means that if you're going to go tell a practitioner a story that like we have the solutions, this is really not the case, right? We have a lot of work ourselves to go figure out why these things are happening. So let me give you a little bit more detail about what we did. Right, so these are the five data sets that we used. This is Ricci versus Di Stefano. I apologize for the typo. I realized this yesterday when I was practicing the talk and I had already uploaded the slides. <laughs> so we have the adult income data set, the German credit, and we have the two ProPublica Compass recidivism data sets. We think that these capture sort of a good amount of variation of the kind of settings that you see. We have multiple protected attributes. We have numerical protected attributes. Right, so we have class imbalances. We have sort of imbalances on the protected attributes as well. And so these are the kinds of things that we tend to sort of attribute to the variation on the results that we get. Uh, we would like to sort of get your data set there too as well. Um, so please come talk to us. We have uh, four interventions. Some of these are sort of parameterized because they're pre-processing, but essentially these are the interventions we found in the literature that were available. Um, we would like to sort of use your intervention as well. Um, you also heard of sort of the AI Fairness 360, which sort of is a different library does something very similar. We're looking into whether or not we can get some of those as well. But we believe these cover sort of a number of different approaches for fairness as well. And we essentially implemented every single fairness measure we could find in the literature. I'm going to show you. So there's a large number of them, essentially like accuracy or fairness. These are relatively simple. They're just like our previous speaker mentioned. They're just sort of functions of the performance of your model, right? So here's what I think is the most interesting finding in our paper, right? So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about this, right? So what we're looking at here is um, a correlation matrix of all of the measures that we collected. So this is essentially run over every single algorithm and every single data set. Every time you see a blue value there, these are positively correlated. Every time you see a red value there, they're negatively correlated, right? And so we reorder here them sort of in the clusters we tend to observe. And what we found is that these are sort of the notions of uh, fairness essentially, right, so disparate impact, or like this is essentially a subtractive version of it, or 
In this case, this is a sort of comparison between the true positive rates among the sensitive variables. These all tend to be co positively correlated with one another, which means that one is big, the other one is big as well. These are all the measures that we tend to see as accuracy, right? And so we can see how these sort of correlate with one another, right? So just to show you one specific example of this, this is one of the theoretical trade-offs that we see in practice, right? So this is sort of um, the calibration measure and the sort of sensitive true positive rate. And look at the, all the algorithms that we run, and we can see how they run along the sort of, um, essentially like the trade-off that we see, but the variance comes from the sort of different algorithms and not from the parameters within the algorithm, right? So if you want to make sort of a choice in here, you can't really just pick hyperparameters, right? Like they're making different choices. That's problematic for us, right? Like we don't have a better one, right? So what are the takeaways? Right, we don't want you to abstract over pre-processing requirements, right? We want your papers to actually say something about how you chose those because those matter, right? Or essentially, you know, start using our library because at least we'll let us all do things uniformly, right? Maybe we can avoid proliferation of measures or maybe we sort of selected bad data, right? Or we missed some of those things, but it turns out that we think that maybe some of these capture the broad variations that exist, right? Finally, right, we were surprised by this, but sort of like different splits in training and processing data or even splits within algorithms generate quite different sources of performance, so we really cannot sort of say that one algorithm beats the other ones, right? Um, we'd like to sort of keep building these, so uh, with that I want to thank you and sort of I would love to sort of hear bug reports and sort of pull requests on that GitHub repository, so thank you very much. Thanks to all the speakers. I'll now invite them all up uh, and take some questions. And in the spirit of you know, fostering interdisciplinary conversation at this conference, I would strongly encourage people from backgrounds disparate from those of the speakers to engage in a dialogue. Um, so please don't be shy. Uh, cool. Uh, my question is to Carlos. Uh, benchmark data sets are a kind of problem everywhere, and the quality of benchmark data sets uh, and of course, you're limited by the benchmark data sets that are out there. What kind of features or characteristics of benchmark data sets would you like to see that we don't currently have in the library and selection available? I don't have a quick answer for that, right? So I can tell you the things that we did see, and you know, people with better sort of knowledge of things that I don't have experience can tell me what I missed, right? So we we consider things like maybe numerical protective attributes are are important, like age, right? So we can pick different thresholds and things like that, right? So. Um, Multiple binary, uh, multiple protected attributes, right? The issue of intersectionality that we saw in gender shades last year, right? This is something we tried to capture and we noticed a big difference, right? But the problem is that we don't know what we missed, right? So you're saying, okay, what did I, if I knew, I could tell you. So um, I'm hoping someone here is going to sort of just say, you missed this and we'll go and try to figure out where they are. But I don't have a quick answer for that, unfortunately. Good. Thanks. Hi, this one's for uh, Carlos as well. Hi, hi I'm uh, Niels Bentilen. I the, I'm the author of uh, Themis ML, which is kind of like one of my earlier stabs at creating a fairness-aware um, machine learning API. It's kind of at a holding period right now. I'm not really working on it. But uh, one thing I found in my experiments was that um, during cross-validation, the, especially the fairness metrics are extremely unstable, uh, and they depend a whole lot on the proportion of the protected attributes. So what, what I ended up having to do to get kind of stable results, which I don't know if it's the right thing to do, is you know stratify on those protected attributes. Uh, do you have any tips or findings on cross-validation? We see we see very much the same results, right? So the sources of variation are due to either hyperparameters or the choices of cross-validation. And um, if we could switch to the slides, I can point to sort of exactly the kinds of variations that we're seeing. I can just it's one of the figures in the paper. Um, I think that stratifying on those is uh, appropriate if you believe that sort of that will correspond to a, like the kind of distributional shift you expect in your test data, right? If it's yeah. not, then it's just truly problematic, and we should try to figure out. Right? So you know these sources of variations here, right? So these come from like the training test splits, right? Yeah. So. Um, yeah, I, I figured that stratifying is not like, I don't know, it, it seems suspect to me because it's not, it doesn't really reflect the real world because for the most part if you have like loan decisions to make, you're not going to have, you know, uh, e you know, equal proportions every single right. time. You'd like them to be sort of, uh, you know, conditioned on any one of the protected attributes, you'd like them to be stable. We find that they're not and we think that's a problem that we, we should address as a community. Okay. So I just want to add one comment to that. It's not just a problem of the data set, it's also the problem of the algorithm. At the end, when you, when, 
so this is i mean this is one of the core notions in machine learning of stability if the algorithm is not stable with respect to different inputs then one possibility is to actually go and change the algorithm so that's something to think about okay thank you I apologize this question is also for carlos but um Wondering with the, the, you commented about the limitations in the correlation results from having relatively small set of data sets. Mm -hmm. Do you see a role for simulation and synthetic data in probing uh, these correlation space, these correlations over a broader space and how we might test the fidelity of that synthetic data? I think you answer your own question. So <laughs> when I did ask you to, you know, I mean, so thank you for asking these questions. Um, we do have synthetic data in our uh, library. You can sort of just use it to train your data. The problem is that it's very hard to sort of uh, make any statement about like the validity and like how you should be deploying them in practice by making a point with some synthetic data, right? Like I, um, I would be very wary of doing that. Uh, but if you have ideas on how to generate synthetic data that would like trigger the specific cases of this and sort of making, the, these are exactly the kinds of future work we'd love to do, so I'll take that offline. We should talk more. <laughs> Uh, this is a question about the fairness under 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 awareness paper, which I really enjoyed your talk. I appreciate I really appreciated that it was about like where the rubber meets the road of how we actually measure this stuff in reality, not with synthetic data or data where we we really know the attributes. Um, I was just curious if you could provide a little bit more context around how um, that technique is used, if it's not and where that lawsuit is. I'm sorry if you did give yeah. that information and like what people are going to do like if that if, if this isn't a good approach can the government just not regulate this can we know yeah what's kind of going on in that area yeah sure thanks for the question uh so basically this is a kind of very well known case in 2013 um where when they have data analysis the they based on their uh proxy method and they found that uh, uh the anna bank uh, charged more um higher interest rate than uh for their minority customers than the wider customers. But this was very controversial because um, um, this kind of method, they use impurity race rather than the true race, and they don't really know the uh, true race. Uh, so even when the banks are required to, to give the fine and require, required to uh, you know, compensate for what they did and compensate uh, for those you know, minority members, they don't know who they should give money to because they're, they only have impurity race rather than true race. So this was very controversial. And uh, also, um, I think there were uh, quite a few debates regarding that, and uh, especially um, some politicians were very mad at this and called it junk science. So there were like a, uh, sort of ongoing debates on that. And recently, I think, um, uh, finally, Trump's office sort of uh, um, forbid them from using this, and they, they think that they might, it might not be appropriate for them to um, charge too much in this regard, so it might change in the future. And, uh, but overall, it's very controversial, and our contribution is basically that uh, uh, in the past, people just feel it's controversial, but they are uncertain about the cause for that. So we're basically trying to fill that gap by uh, categorizing that uh, theoretically and generally, and also uh, use data analysis to uh, figure out the underlying mechanism about the bias. So basically, it's because that uh, we all know that uh, the geolocation is kind of very controversial feature, and in credit decision making, people are not allowed to use that in the uh, decision policy. But it turns out that if you use that also in the uh, proxy model, it can be also problematic. I think that is the uh, main insight of our work and also uh, the main gap that we aim to fill. Yeah. Um, so we have a question from the Slack channel from Jonathan Korn uh, for you as well. Uh, and the question is, how would the proposed soft-weighted classification estimator be used in situations beyond bias detection, like for the regulatory goal of identifying harmed individuals to receive restitution? So the applicability of this classifier? Yeah. Uh, so, if I understand it right, it's basically asking about the applicability of this sort of weighted estimator uh, uh, for the disparity. Um, so, I would like to say that um, uh, we propose this uh, mostly trying to understand the uh, property of the estimation when the 
uh, unprotected class, when the protected class is unobserved, but it's not really a panacea because you can, uh, we also show that it still has a uh, bios source, uh, which can be problematic. And uh, especially if you move beyond like um, more sophisticated uh, disparity measures, it can be harder to validate that. Um, so I would like to say that the primary thing and the most important thing is probably to call for connection for the uh, protected class. That's the most important thing. And we probably couldn't um, hope to do everything perfectly when we don't have the right thing to measure. So this is the first thing. And the second thing is that we can consider using the weighted estimator as an addition to the total box because it tends to have different behavior uh, than the traditional estimator. So probably it can give us a plausible range of the truth. And also the third thing is that uh, uh, a po possible direction is to uh, even move beyond these two estimators or other existing estimators and to think about that uh, uh, given the limited information we have on the like, surname, geolocation, but we don't have the true protected class, given the limited information, what can we really do? Can we possibly uh, you know, give a plausible range for the, for the true disparity? Um, so I think that's, that would be a very interesting question to think about. Yeah, that's my reply for that. Thanks. Hi, um, kind of short. Hi, um, this is Bruce Pain from Columbia Law School. And my question is also for fairness and, and, and awareness. Sorry for picking up you again. So um, thank you so much for bringing up this topic because we actually use your technique in our research. And we came across the same problem, but we came to the comp uh, to a conclusion that this bias is gonna be, um, it's not gonna be against underprivileged group most of the time. That was uh, sort of a conclusion that came, we came to among ourselves, like personal opinion, that like we kind of feel that this technique is still um, helpful in revealing the, uh, a problem because it is actually against a privileged or like, um, a privileged group. So I wonder if you have ever looked into the direction of the bias, whether or not it's always against certain minority group, or it's, it could be against any group, majority or minority. I see. So uh, thanks for the question. And uh, let me answer your question first. But I didn't really uh, totally understand your conclusion. And I would be very uh, interested in what you found with uh, uh, your problem here. And uh, so the question is, my. Uh, understanding about the estimation bias direction, whether it favors the uh, advantage group or favors the disadvantage group. And uh, for the uh, traditional or existing threshold estimation here, it's very hard to tell. All I can say is that uh, um, if we use very high threshold, then it tends to overestimate the outcome disparity under the current um, you know, existing societal inequality embedding in the geolocation. So very high threshold, we tend to overestimate the disparity, which means that uh, we sort of unfavorably think that, uh, how should I say, we sort of, uh, we think that we favor the, the advantage group too much, but in practice, actually, we don't. So if we use a high threshold, we would get that uh, wrong answer. But if we use very low threshold, then it's possible that we would have underestimation bias, which means that we underestimate the, the, harm, the harm towards the disadvantaged group by the policy. Um, okay, I, I think I have one last question for Nishit. Uh, I was curious, I guess you didn't have a chance really to get into the details of your reduction understandably, um, but I was curious how you would see this being incorporated into existing companies that have like tools for optimizing whatever objective they have. Could you uh, use your technology to help them uh, add fairness to that? Uh, thanks, Nicole. So the, uh, I guess the uh, Companies which are curious about our tools would, uh, uh, you know, would probably already be using some such tool that exists before, except that they would be using a different algorithm for different fairness concerns. So, for them to use our method, uh, they would have to specify their their performance functions or the constraints in the format that we require. Once they give it to us in that format, 
our algorithmic description takes over and uh, you know it just outputs uh, the meta algorithm gives rise to a specialized algorithm for that particular fairness metric which then will output the... But I guess like they, they just have to specify the fairness constraints, the accuracy you don't need to like, they, they can use whatever, ac you, you call their algorithm, their existing algorithm as a routine? No, we don't call any algorithm as a subroutine. We call our algorithm as a subroutine, the, the one for our constraints, but we call it multiple times and they have to specify an accuracy as well. So, so they have to specify the parameters that they would normally specify for an algorithm which, work, which they're, they're expecting to work in a certain setting. We are not asking for any additional parameters for them. We are just asking that they specify the fairness constraints that they are interested in, in our language, that's all. And then rest, we produce a new algorithm. So our algorithms are different from the one that you know, Carlos here experimented with. Okay, that's uh, great. Let's thank all the speakers of the session again. And